Anyways, if I can just jump right into it. Um, I listened to your program last week, and I do have to say that I was impressed because you guys don't go with the, the God of the Gaps um, attitude to discredit evolution. You don't misuse the word theory. You don't, um, you know, characterize, like, the, the why did we come from monkeys, this and that. And I, and I was kind of impressed with that. But that being said, I did kind of have some um, criticisms and was hoping to answer some of your questions that you posed last week about evolution. Go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Um, yes. One thing that I did notice is that when you're evaluating um, scientific advancements or scientific research, for example, um, Dr. Wolfenden's paper last week from UNC about the, uh, the evolution of uroprofrenogen decarboxylase, if you recall that, um, the argument that you made was how could life have evolved if this reaction is needed for life and the half-life is so long. Um, I, I guess kind of the answer to that question is that, that first off, uh, urod, which is I guess how it's abbreviated, um, wasn't really needed for early life. By the time that oxygen appeared, the cellular machinery had already been around for like two billion years. And in fact, those early anaerobes actually um, use something called sarahim, which doesn't need urod for its formation. So I guess kind of my qualm with what you had said on the program is that you, your lack of an explanation for how something could have evolved, I guess, is presented as if there is no explanation in the sense of evolution cannot um, explain how it evolved, when in reality, what evolution does when creating enzymes and things like that is it finds alternate uses for them. And as far as um, the urod in general, if you actually take a look at the structural analysis of it, it does show a really strong homology between the enzymes that are needed to make sarahim and urod and begin with, or to begin with, rather. So once oxygen finally came around on Earth, there were only a few modifications needed, and then you get urod in the new pathway. So the, the half-life issue is really kind of moot. Does that make sense? Uh, this is Ken Samples. I was on the show, and I wish Dr. Rahner were here to respond to you, because he could address uh, the specificity of the, th- the issues that he was drawn. Uh, Whitney, I only want to say this. Um, it, it seems to me what Dr. Rana was attempting to do uh, is, to, is to really distinguish himself or his ways of thinking from the God of the Gaps. He wasn't saying, uh, in my opinion, that, Evolution has no explanation for this, or there may not be some uh, uh, potential ways of thinking about this from a naturalist point of view. I think what he was uh, candidly saying was, look, we're drawing inference to the best explanation. We're looking at two perspectives, and we're saying we think this uh, viewpoint where there would be uh, a mind behind the universe, there would be a design behind the universe, that it seems to explain the data better than the naturalistic perspective. But that being said, considering like the, the strong homology and with that being how evolution works by adapting um, already existing functions to new functions, wouldn't the strong homology indicate that no, that is not the best explanation? Well, I'm, I w- I'm going to have to defer to Dr. Rana on that point. I would be out yeah. of my league to be able to respond to you. I, I just want to underscore, however, that uh, we make it a strong position I think to say, look, um, uh, let's 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 evaluate the positions, and then let's draw what we think is is the best explanation of that. Sure. If there's a weakness in the naturalist position that we've overlooked, then I think we need to take a second look. Oh, I agree with you. Um, the, the the second comment that I really wanted to make was that you guys made a question of. I don't think that, or you don't think that creationism or intelligent design should be held to a different standard as science. Um. Do you, was that you making that point? Do you agree with that? Uh, you're, I, I, having not been on the show, this is Jeff Zwerink here, and not being a biologist, I'm not sure what, what Fuzz actually said. Was that your comment, Ken? Or? Uh, no, Fuzz, Fuzz did say that, and I, but I think the context is, as I recall, that uh, he was essentially saying that we need to, we need to hold both of these views of the same standard. That is, if we allow a naturalistic perspective to reason in a particular way, uh, why wouldn't we also allow somebody with an intelligent design perspective to reason? Let, let, let's, not, uh, let's not over-scrutinize the intelligent design idea. That's, that's what I recall. But go, go ahead. What was your, what, what's your point about that? Well, my point is kind of like if you were to treat them as, as equal, let's treat them both as scientific um, theories, for example. Um, what would we expect to see if, if evolution were true? Or I guess if creationism were true, we would expect to see like a, a non-temporal stratification of fossils in the sense that we would find 
poodles with trilobites, man and dinosaurs, things like that in the fossil record. Um, we'd expect why, why, why would we expect to see that? If creationism were true? Yes. Well, it, 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 creationism would contend that all organisms were created at the same point in time. Therefore, you would no, expect no, no, to see the, the mixing. That's, a, that's a, a, a misunderstanding of what our position is. Oh, okay. There are a bunch of there there are a bunch of there are a bunch of creationists. They're typically the young earth flavor that uh, that do say that, but that's not at all what our position is. Our position is basically that the the fossil record resent, represents an accurate history of uh, you know the the chronology and the timing of all that is an accurate history of the 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 life that God introduced into the planet in preparation for humanity arriving. Wait, so do you believe that we share a common descendant with um, the great apes like Michael Behe does, or? No, we we would argue that the that the the genetic link between chimpanzees and humans is that there's not this line of descent that 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 you could trace back actual figures that humanity was was a special creation by God. Okay, so you think that everything else evolved, just not humans? Is no, we don't even say that. that. That that's also not true. That there there are there is some region. There is some application of natural process and that uh, you know birds can become longer beaks have different kinds of feathers and have adaptation to their environment but that there is a limit beyond which uh, that that can occur and that God does actually work and introduce species uh, by creative acts rather than by using natural processes okay but what about the 40 speciation events that have been documented in the past 15 years I mean, wouldn't that kind of to give discredit to what you're saying? No, that those are examples of you know birds becoming birds type stuff. There, they're, that 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 sort of stuff does happen, and that that's very consistent with what the biblical text describes. But we're talking about birds and birds, not birds becoming dinosaurs or vice versa. Oh, okay. Well, if well, then I guess my question for that would be: if birds were always birds, then why do birds have genes for making teeth? Why do whales have genes for making legs and things and like that? And that, that's where I would be. I, I would, you know, again, you're 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 getting the astrophysicist talking about the the the, the biological and genetic stuff. But uh, my understanding in talking to Fuzz is that there's an enormous amount of stuff that we do not understand about the uh, the DNA and how it works, and stuff that we used to call junk or that we used to think we understood has far more function and complexity to it than what we do. And so, our, our, our my my understanding or what what I take that not being a specialist is that we need to be careful careful about saying that, oh, uh, birds have stuff that can create teeth when we don't really understand the complete function of what that is, that uh, l let's wait and let a little bit more of that detail come in before we make definitive pronouncements about it. I think that there is more than enough information that has come in to be able to make a good uh, Well, there, there, there's certainly we some commonality in the genetics of what produces teeth that is there, but that's to say that that only has the function of producing teeth or that's its sole role or even primary role is a little bit of an overstatement is my understanding at this point. Well, well how could you test that? One way would be to, to knock that gene out, completely remove it, and see if the organism's harmed. But then again, if it's making a non-functional protein or, or it's switched off to begin with, then, see, something that's switched off can't be acted on by natural selection, so it would rapidly accumulate mutations. My, my, my only point in all of this is that, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, there is a bunch of stuff going on with the genetic record, mm -hmm. the genetic material, in terms of how the genes are expressed, where they're expressed, the timing, um, that all of that that was attributed off to junk DNA at one point in time that we're just now beginning to understand and then there, there's this virtual flood of information coming in about it mm -hmm. I, I, you know it's let's wait and see what we understand about that because it's changing the way we thought about how DNA worked and how genetic material worked and so mm -hmm. yeah that, that's about the extent of what I can comment on not being an expert on it. Uh, Whitney yeah. I think it would be great if we could get you to call and I'm, I don't know how we'd work this out but mm -hmm. uh, it'd be great to have you have an opportunity to have a little give and take with Dr. Rana. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be good. Um, if I could, just one last comment was that I guess kind of I never really brought my line of reasoning full circle, and that was simply that if, if you were to, to take a look at, at creationism as a scientific theory, virtually every major breakthrough that has come in the past 200 years has kind of contradicted it, and it would be done, is kind of my attitude of, of why it's not taken seriously. It's because when it is looked at from a scientific perspective, I mean, the overwhelming majority with the exception of, you know, like 0.01% of the scientific community in terms of biologists, you know, realize that.
So, what, 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 I, what, what I find intriguing, though, about that, Whitney, is more from a philosophical and a historical point of view is there are many people who think that the driving worldview force that gave birth to experimental science was Christian theism mm-hmm. and that, uh, you know, the paradigm that birthed science allowed it to flourish I mean, we can go back to Newton, we can go back to Pascal and all of these people. They felt very comfortable in in that context. And so uh, if if a creationist view or a theistic view of the universe would be knocked down so easily, it seems ironic that that is the worldview that produced this incredible enterprise. I think you're confusing um, evolution with atheism. Well, well, 